just because you analyze a deal as a as a expert i mean harvard degree real estate commercial ccim abc one two three you know i got all of the all of the licensure under the sun doesn't mean you're a successful real estate investor so for me it was a case of being able to um and look the word pivot has been overused but being able to very quickly understand that I have to adjust as this landscape is adjusting with me. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Dave Seymour is a retired 16-year veteran of the fire service, and he launched his real estate career over a decade ago. Uh, if you're not aware, he's rapidly becoming one of the country's top investors. And within his first few years, Dave transacted tens of millions of dollars in real estate and has become one of the nation's leading experts in commercial multifamily transactions. Uh, other fun facts about Dave is that he's an ex-reality TV flipping expert. I guess, uh, you know, you can get on and find the four seasons he was on and see all the uh, all the flipping shows that, that Dave uh, hosted and was was part of. And um, yeah, just ple pleasure to have you on the show today, Dave. Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate the invite. Appreciate you having me on to share my incredible knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, you you, you, uh, you uh, self deprecate your uh, yourself. I guess if that's even the right word to say that. I probably yeah. just put that entire elevate or deprecate, right? Se self deprecating humor. <laughs> Make fun of oneself to allow somebody to feel good about themselves. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of that as well, whatever it takes. Fantastic, man. There's three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. Can you very quickly tell us, where did you start? Where are you now? How did you get there? Yeah, great question. Look, I started um, with a, uh, a financially broke attitude or, or uh, skill set. You know, which was based off of the information I, I was given growing up. I have a funny accent. I was born in London, emigrated to the States back in the uh, mid 80s, 20 years old, and, uh, you know, just worked my, uh, my assets off, trading time for money. So, you know, that has a, a ceiling as a limitation on income potential. Um, uh, around 2006, seven, I was working in the fire department, um, 42, 46 hours a week, construction, another 42, 44, part-time job, another 20. I wonder why, wonder why I was, uh, you know, all my relationships were falling apart. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, I, um, in that construction world, I got to see real estate investors coming onto my job sites, wearing cleaner clothes, driving nicer cars and uh, smiling, which, which, you know, which wasn't, wasn't part of my regular routine. So you know, that, that drove me to learn. It drove me to ask questions. It drove me towards education. Um, I was going through a pretty rough time, uh, you know, personally, as well as, as financially in 2007, eight, I was losing my primary residence in a foreclosure crisis that a lot of people went through, um, through ignorance. You know, I, I, I hold responsibility for it today. Right. And, um, found myself in a, in a, one of those traveling circus real estate seminars, you know, no money down real estate. You can oh too. Ba, ba, ba. And um, look, man, I, I, I went for it. Mm. Um, I kind of, I kind of used the Tony Robbins model. You know, you, you burn the bridges if you, if you want to take the Island. And that was what I did. And I went all in. And um, the first transaction I did was a, was a wholesale single family transaction. I made $5,000 and I didn't own the real estate. And I thought to myself, this is either illegal or it's a secret. I figured out it was a secret because the cops didn't come and arrest me. And, um, you know, I went from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Picked up um, some, um, some single family um, buy and holds, some small multifamily buy and holds. I learned that I didn't want to be a landlord. I was a lot happier uh, not taking the phone call that Barbie got stuck in the toilet at four o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, uh, just, just challenges, people challenges, found myself in the lending business. I was a hard money lender, private lender. Um, I began my own, um, uh, coaching and education and found that to be, um, uh, highly, um, challenging from the standpoint of setting expectations. Mm. You know, so, somebody thinks they're going to make a million bucks in a week because they're now doing real estate. It's, it's not a reality. It's a, you know, it's a fallacy. So, you know, I learned, uh, I learned a lot about that world. And at the same time, for me, um, I was always in motion, right? I, being stagnant is a challenge. 
I uh, got to surround myself with some of the very, very best people in this industry nationwide because of the TV show. It allowed me to have exposure on CNN and NBC and Squawk Box. And all of a sudden, I'm a, you know, I'm an expert because I was on a TV show. I'll let you know a little secret. Just because you're on a TV show doesn't mean you're an expert. You could be an absolute idiot. It just looks good on camera, you know? Right. Um, but anyway, that was it. That was the transition. I was running a, a, a pretty substantial um, hard money lending business, uh, late 19, early 20. We know what happened in 2020. And that lending business was out of business very quickly because Wall Street stopped buying our uh, non-QM loans. So I couldn't turn the, um, the LOC that we were working from. And uh, regrouped with my now partner, Walter Novicki, and our third partner, Eric Wilson. Walter had done approximately a quarter of a billion dollars with the multifamily transactions in the Southwest Florida market. And we said, let's double down and go all in. Uh, we um, went through our SEC filings for a $100 million um, um, uh, uh, private equity fund, primarily investing in multifamily assets, B class. And uh, that's, that's where we started. And today we have about three, 320 million in the pipe in various phases of development um, as the compression of cap rates um, came into the marketplace with all the silly money that needed to be spent. Um, instead of staying just in, in what we had described in our PPM, uh, we pivoted out of that into some ground up construction. Um, we're building a 106 unit multifamily asset in Cape Coral. I've got uh, 320 single family built for rent communities uh, in, in transition in uh, Cape Coral as well. Office building, Fort Myers. Woo, daddy's busy. So that's, uh, that's the short story from broke as a joke to, uh, to being in a position today where I raise a lot of capital, deploy it and pay my returns. So Man, that's fan, that's fantastic. I, lo <laughs> I love I love the uh, you know the the always in motion idea. Yeah. How do you yeah. balance being always in motion and yet at the same time going you know with the idea of an inch wide and a mile deep? Because what we find is a lot of people they stay in motion for so long they never get anywhere. Yeah, you know it, to 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 bring that down to a simple statement, I saw a lot in my years of coaching and business coaching and, and real estate education was that there are a lot of people get comfortable in, in analysis, right? When we talk about that paralysis analysis, just because you analyze a deal as a, as a expert, I mean, Harvard degree, real estate, commercial, CCIM, ABC, one, two, three, you know, I got all of the, all of the licensure under the sun doesn't mean you're a successful real estate investor. So for me, it was a case of being able to, um, and look, the word pivot has been overused, but being able to very quickly understand that I have to adjust as this landscape is adjusting with me. So if I'm always in analysis and I'm never pulling the trigger, I'm not making the offer, I'm not raising the capital, I'm not deploying the capital, then, uh, you know, I'm just playing the game. And, and look, man, there's a, there's, let's just be zero degrees and be frank with each other. There's a lot of people out there right now that are playing the game and not necessarily being successful in the game. Right. And, um, you know, that puts a lot of capital at risk. And as a, as a fiduciary and a steward of other people's capital, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in a 10-year play pushing rents at 7% 7, 7 every year. That's how we're going to make money. No, stupid. That's how you're going to lose money. So. Right. You know, for me, I, I, I have to I have to really, really be able to adjust and focus on statistics and, and, and market trends to be able to be successful with it. But you got to make an offer. You got to move money. Nothing happens if money doesn't move. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. What how long did it take you in early 19 or, or late 19, early 20? I guess when when, you know, COVID kicked off, how long yeah. did it take you to figure out that your lending business was just time to time to time to shut the doors? Three days. Wow. <laughs> so what I did was is I, uh, I had enough relationships in the lending community to make sure that my borrowers were not stuck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I turned those borrowers over to um, other lending partners that I had who could, who could carry that load for us. It was about 15 million in, in deal flow at that moment in time. See, the challenge was it was almost uh, one of those moments of, um, of clarity. It was almost a, an epiphany for me because 
I realized that that moment in time, he or she who controls the capital is going to win this game, right? Sure. And I was working off of a $50 million line of credit that was not my own balance sheet. So I never really had money. I never had that money to lend. I was brokering capital. It's a lot easier and a lot, uh, it's a lot less risky to be a broker, right? Sure. It, takes no, it takes no cojones. It takes no skin in the game. You know, it's like, I'm a broker, I'm intelligent. And um, I realized that if I wanted to be, uh, you know, as successful as, as, as I believed I could be and the company that I represent, then it was a case of taking control of that capital. So that was it for us. I mean, we were out in, like I said, three days because the line of credit had a, I think it was a five day turn. Oh, so if wow. I couldn't sell that note back to Wall Street in, in a couple of days, then, uh, you know, the, the, the notes would do so. So yeah, how did you, it was how interesting. Did you unwind that again? That, I mean, that, that sounds like I wouldn't have slept for three days. Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying I slept for three days. Um, look, here's the thing. I think real estate at any level, whether it's what we're doing today at the commercial level, ground up, GCs, et cetera, or whether it's a single family buy, fix and flip, or even a single family wholesale transaction, selling the equity in a contract. I think real estate has as a, an inert um, gift that a lot of under industries don't have. And that's that collaboration is better than competition. Right. I'll say that again, collaboration is better than competition. Um, there is always an opportunity to collaborate. So because at Freedom Venture, we bring that collaborative um, you know, mindset to everything that we do, when met with a challenge as we did you know, with the lending business, I went to my other lending collaborative partners and I call them partners because I still, you know, I still get a check every now and again off of a referral basis, which is nice, which is appreciated. So, um, you know, I just took that, um, um, borrower pool that we had in place and turned it over to the, to the guys and, and ladies in the business that I know trusted and loved would take care of my clients. Um, you know, if you think about, if you think about, you know, the, the crash 2009, it wasn't anybody in that financial industry who was handing their clients over to somebody who could take care of them, right? They're just like, sorry, doors are closed. And that's the same, look, and that's the same in raising money as well. Um, you know, I think, about, I think about my clients, I think about their capital invested in our projects, their capital invested in our, our fund structures, et cetera. And, and for me, it's like always having a plan B, C, and D. I know every accredited investor signs a PPM that says you can lose every dime. Sure. This is risky, right? We all know that. Right. But that's not, that's not an out. That's not a get out of jail free card, man. That's just the SEC doing its thing. So, right. you know, I like collaboration. I want to be able to take care of the people that invest with us and alongside us. Um, and at whatever capacity, whether they're borrowing capital to do a buy, fix and flip, or whether they're lending capital for a, you know, a targeted double digit return, it's the same concept. Raising capital is something, you know, and lending. I'm, I'm sure you got a, a lot of experience on the lending side. So being familiar with the borrower, uh, with the lender, with all, you know, being wearing all of those yeah. hats, I'm sure it would lend itself, no pun intended, really well to, <laughs> you know, going out and then raising large amounts of capital. Were there any struggles sure. along that journey? You guys say, hey, look, you're doing great. You've done a quarter billion dollars. It's awesome. Let's mm -hmm. go open a hundred million dollar fund. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. a big mm -hmm. jump for a lot of people. What were some things mm -hmm. you did to really make sure that that took off with the right inertia? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, man. And it, look, I don't care how experienced you are in the business. It's trial and error, right? Um, we tried a, a couple of different marketing strategies and marketing capital investments um, that basically failed miserably. Um, chasing down and enticing and engaging uh, the retail investor um, is, is interesting. Um, I use an analogy in every one of our E-suite meetings is nobody in this room, nobody engages in pushing a donkey up a hill. Okay, mm. think about that for a second. If it feels like pushing a donkey up a hill, if it feels like resistance, then it's wrong. Something isn't right. And usually what I found was, is that there weren't enough questions being asked of the potential lender than there were in everybody runs out with features and benefits. I've got targeted double digit returns. I'm in the Florida market. I'm in the best market. I'm the balls. Look at me. I'm all that in a bag of chips. Yay. Give me right. money. And people go, no, I don't want to give you any money. 
you haven't asked me what I want. Right. So as soon as I was able to um, identify the, you know, we call them pain points, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as soon as I was able to identify what my accredited investor was really looking for, that's when I became more successful in raising the capital. And a lot of the times it was the simplicity of risk aversion, taxes, um, you know, fear of a, of a major financial um, uh, event in their lives was, was, was prevalent, um, you know, be it illness. And then as soon as COVID hit, we saw so much of a knee-jerk reaction financially Boy. that for some people it was a challenge and for other people it was an opportunity, right? Right. And isn't, isn't, isn't that the case in all things, right? One man's trash, another man's treasure, that kind of concept. So once we dialed that in, we got better at it. And then I would say eight months, nine months into that process, we began to feel the pain and the workload of managing that database of people, right? Um, and I mean that with respect to any one of our investors, but, you know, the investor who put in 50 grand made a lot more noise than the investor who put in, you know, 500,000. So what can you do to educate them and bring them up the gradient? We worked hard on that. And then we, um, we began to entertain some of the um, high net worth, family office, smaller institutional capital. Um, that required a lot less education, but it required a lot more relationship building. So I don't think there's an easier, softer way to, to any of these, these um, challenges in raising capital. Um, you know, if somebody tells you it's easy to raise money, they're a liar. Um, it's, uh, it, it takes work. It takes finesse. It takes track record. But um, I, I tell you, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in any other position than where I am right now. I, I love what I do. You know, I love what I do. So. That that's fantastic, and I and I love the idea of, of how'd you put it? You know, who pushes the donkey up a hill? Yeah, if you're pushing a donkey up a hill, it's wrong, man. It's wrong. like you know, guy said to me one time. He said, um, in any any sales type environment, he said it's really hard to sell a hamburger to somebody who's not hungry, right? Even if it's the best, juiciest prime beefiest yummiest burger that was ever freaking invented if i'm already full and i'm not hungry i don't want your burger right so how do you create a void that your product then fills right and that that that's the art of um of uh bringing in um the uh the uh you know the traditional investor Fantastic. Dave, we've got just a few minutes here left. I want to hear, I mean, I know we've kind of talked about this on this show before, but you know, why you guys are doing build for rent and doing a lot more ground up. Uh, yeah. what's, what's, what's the driving cause of that versus value add and, and how are you finding opportunity on that front? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Look, man, here's, here's, here's what we saw very quickly. Um, I would say eight or nine months ago, we began to see the um, value add opportunities um, at a six and a half, seven cap acquisition price. Right. Um, with the opportunity to push to, you know, maybe 10% return on investment. We saw all of those opportunities practically disappear overnight, right? Mm. Um, the amount of capital that came into Southwest Florida, Arizona, Atlanta, the Carolinas, um, your neck of the woods, man. I mean, the amount of money that's come into those those areas has been unprecedented. It's been exorbitant. So what, what I saw in the marketplace was a lot of um, operators decided to go with a longer run, a seven to 10 year run on a deal flow with the only factor that they could really put in there to offer those eight to 10% cash on cash returns that an investor is looking for was to go in with, you know, your average 2% um, uh, expense increase, and yet they're putting a 10-year run at a 5% rent increase. Right. That That's, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the idiot. I, I don't know. But I, I could not, in good conscience, raise money under that premise. Sure. So we have a responsibility to, to hunt yield. And what we did was we began to look at what was out there for, for, for a yield opportunity. And we found that in building our own assets. And we can build fast. Southwest Florida, it's all CBS, cinder block and stucco construction. 
once they start throwing block, I mean, it moves fast, man, real fast. Hurricane tie the roof, interior done. I mean, we can get through there. We're doing 106 units. We anticipate being um, from scraping dirt to uh, OC, I would say 14 months, 16 months. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then stabilized in another six months because of the supply and demand after that. Sure. So, you know, the, num the numbers on this one, just to give you a big picture idea, on the on the, uh, the 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 cost acquisition piece of the whole project, about 19 million, 22 million. We'll go in that that price range. Then once stabilized, not 10 years out, but two and a half, three years out, pushing a cap rate up to five, five and a half, where the cap is currently at three, three and a half. So I push it five. So I'm I'm building in what I perceive to be, you know, a buffer. I'm now looking at a 36 million dollar valuation based off of three percent rent increase two percent expenditure right so building in those buffers so that's why that's why it's made sense when you start looking at the millennials and the um the older generations downsizing i've got a 27 year old son he has zero interest in owning his own home he wants to own cash flow in real estate which he does but he doesn't want to own his own home so, you know, in the Florida market, we, we have a, a massive, massive shortfall of both rental and housing, and it's only getting worse down there. So, you know, we're going to fill that void. And look, man, just watch some, what some of the bigger guys are doing. You start looking at the Wall Street money that's been allocated uh, billions of dollars to this strategy. I'm not up there with those guys yet, but um, I'm okay just picking up the crumbs that, that, that they drop along the way uh, as they're doing the same projects, you know? Absolutely. Dave, I've certainly enjoyed this. Thank you for taking the time to come on today, kind of pull back the secrets on your company, on what it's taken for you to grow, shift, mindset shift, pivot. I mean, all the things you've done, you've worn a lot of hats and uh, yeah. it's just fun, uh, fun to see you in your lane doing what you do. Final four Thanks, questions man. for you are this. If you could give our listeners one tool or resource that you can't live without. One tool or resource that I can't live without. Um, Audible. Business books, Audible. <laughs> I can't read, but I can listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Number two for you is this. If you could help our listeners avoid one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? Um, th that would be due diligence. Um, trust, but verify. Um, don't ever take my word or anybody else's word for anything and trust your gut. Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. And the hardest, I think, of all lessons is trust your gut. Mm. So mm. that's, uh, mm. that's a good one. When it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Uh, we're ESG friendly. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not overly, you know, save the planet and hug the trees. Um, I, think there's a, I think there's a middle road in there somewhere. But I, I do honestly believe that we need to start looking at, um, you know, creating a, a better environment in our, in our facilities for, for not only our tenants, but the people who live around them. So, you know, we're a green builder. I think that's uh, that's an important part of what we do. Fabulous. Fabulous. Dave, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, learn more about you and what you guys are doing, what is the best way to do that? Uh, you can go to freedomventure.com, jump on there, get a little education, see what we're doing. Um, punch in some info. We'll, we'll touch gloves with you. Or I'm old school. You can call us at 781 <laughs> 9224418781922 and make sure you uh, let them know that uh, you you heard me here and uh, let's have a chat let's see if there's uh, some deals to be done fabulous thank you dave appreciate your time god bless brother thank you hey thanks for listening to the how to scale commercial real estate podcast if you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.